And so there will be three areas that I want to address in this brief presentation. The first will be a little bit about the question of Islam and Muslims, um, because they remain to be, Islam and, and the Muslim world remains such a prominent uh, issue of discussion throughout the world because of the ongoing developments in those parts of the world, I think it is pertinent to once again, uh, frankly, discuss how we are approaching uh, those issues. The second area, more pertinent to global geopolitics, is of course the situation that has unfolded in, uh, quote unquote, the AFPAC region, as uh, the American administration has called it, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, that theater of the war on terror. And finally, I'll come back to the issue of uh, Islam and political Islam, particularly in light of the rise of groups like ISIS and so on. So these are the three areas uh, that I want to address. And so the discussion about Islam and Muslims is very important uh, because I, I, I dare say we have yet to escape some of the more reductionist, essentialist, tropes and mantras being uh, uh, said about the Muslim world. And we engage in these uh, essentialisms of, of the Muslim world as a monolith, as Islam producing these uh, misogynistic, violent, anti-minority, etc. elements, and as if that is uh, essential or inherent uh, to Islam and the Muslim world. A veritable Islam industry, as I call it, emerged uh, after September the 11th in the West. In the United States in particular, it became very easy for people who had no engagement with the tradition, with the, with the area, etc., to engage uh, on the issue, to become instant experts on the Muslim world. And, uh, you know, it was telling that since September the 11th, there have been more books written on Islam and Muslims than the previous 500 years. So a lot of people are writing about Islam and Muslims, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it is uh, knowledgeable uh, discussion of the subject. Uh, right after 9-11, there was a sudden interest in, and fascination in uh, the Quran, the holy book of Muslims. And many of us didn't know whether that was a good or bad thing because of the type of linkages that were being made between what is written and said in the Quran and Muslim political behavior. And of course, the problem in this entire discussion was the, was the uh, deployment of what the uh, scholar Mahmoud Mamdani calls culture talk, the reduction of, of Muslim political behavior to a type of psycho-cultural analysis, well, uh, the larger culture of the Muslim world or the religion itself necessarily produces these responses. So I think here at the Rhodes Forum, um, it is very important for us to remind ourselves that there, has been a, there have been a lot of tropes and mantras and a certain narrative about Islam and Muslims uh, that continues to recycle old orientalist cliches, very vulgar cl cliches at times about why and how Muslims behave the way they do. And I think that all of us here who are trying to promote dialogue and, and, and a more peaceful and just world need to reject those types of approaches which, have, uh, which did gain currency once again after 9-11. So that's, that's some introductory remarks about the, the broad issue of, of Islam in the Muslim world. Turning to the AFPAC region, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and that theater of the global war on terrorism. Uh, as we all know, the US NATO uh, withdrawal is taking place uh, this year. Some may call it a withdrawal, some may uh, like to emphasize more a redeployment. Um, as uh, Dr. Muzaffar uh, mentioned, there is a quote unquote pivot to Asia taking place and the American uh, ruling establishment also consider, uh, engages in these temporary strategic redeployments. And so I don't, the same is the case of Iraq. 
But of course, Afghanistan uh, by Obama was presented as the good war, as opposed to the bad war, the evil war, the Iraq war, which of course has once again become uh, the good war um, with, the, with the, the entry of the United States again um, into Iraq and now Syria. But Afghanistan from the very beginning, the, the, uh, President Barack Obama presented as the good war. Uh, where the U.S. had every right to engage in, in basically a war of revenge and to take out uh, al-Qaeda and those protecting uh, al-Qaeda. And it was important to say that even at that time, those protecting um, al-Qaeda, supposedly the Taliban, uh, did put out an offer. It's important to remind ourselves that if presented with evidence, we are willing to perhaps turn them over. But of course, the empire... Uh, doesn't need to present any evidence for what it engages in throughout the world. And so you had the war in 2001. And the, for the first two years, it looked like, well, this was an easy war, no resistance, no insurgency, nothing. But it was very uh, interesting for many of us that the, there was indeed at the time of the invasion no, no real fight that took place. And of course, many of us who were observing the region at that time realized that the backers of the Taliban, basically the, the Pakistani military and intelligence agencies, had given instructions, had given advice to the Taliban force they had supported for those many years that it's useless and senseless to fight at this time. Uh, shave off your beards and go to the mountains uh, on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and wait to fight another day. And that is exactly what they did. And so when the occupation forces entered, it was largely without a fight. And uh, the small amount of Al-Qaeda forces did the same. But within a few years, what we all predicted, a resistance and insurgency did emerge. And they have effectively mounted a resistance which has led to what we are seeing right now. And many of us also said at that time that, well, by that point, the Taliban regime had become so unpopular that maybe, you know, even though many of us didn't think this was the answer, the US NATO occupation may have had a chance of succeeding, although the way things have always gone with foreign occupations, and particularly in the context of Afghanistan, uh, they most likely would not succeed. But of course, the country was so destitute and impoverished at that time, and the Taliban regime so unpopular, that perhaps it was an open question if the US NATO occupation had seriously invested in efforts of reconstruction and development and so on, just maybe um, it would have been given a chance. But of course, there, we live in different times. We live in the times of neoliberalism, and if there's no investment in health and education and social welfare taking place in the US and in Europe itself, uh, it's highly unlikely that they will take place elsewhere. And so not only was there no reconstruction, but of course an incredibly corrupt, incompetent uh, local puppet regime, um, the Karzai regime parachuted from abroad into Kabul and of course, they were able, with all of the foreign heavy investment taking place, to siphon off a significant amount of that money into buying a thin layer of the uh, sections of the elite in giving them at least some legitimacy amongst some warlords. But it's been a disastrous occupation. Um, it has been highly arrogant, brutal, incomp incompetent, and corrupt. Um, NATO, U.S. air raids, strikes... Uh, taking place throughout the country, heavy civilian toll, uh, and so on. And it was only predic entirely predictable that the insurgency uh, would, would gain momentum and that what we call right now as the Taliban in Afghanistan is really an umbrella group, an organization that consists of a variety of different factions and elements who have a beef with the occupation, who have... Uh, suffered ordinary uh, tribe, tribes throughout the region, uh, throughout the country, uh, other warlords who may not have gotten what they thought was their fair share in the spoils of the occupation. Um, 
And so, and in this context, we also see, uh, have seen the puppet government of Karzai also raising voices because he knew that the game is over in terms of uh, the U.S. NATO occupation, and it's best to be, at this point, on the right side of history rather than the wrong side of it. But of course, the scapegoat of all of uh, the problems of the U.S. NATO war in Afghanistan has been Pakistan. Pakistan is to blame for the insurgency, for the resistance, for the failed occupation. Um, and uh, particularly during the Musharraf years, but even after uh, General Pervez Musharraf was in charge in Pakistan. And of course, there's no doubt that the Pakistanis have had a long-standing relationship uh, with the Taliban. Uh, but ignoring all of these problems and essentially um, creating perhaps the most dangerous component of the Afghan uh, Pakistan uh, US theater of the war of the war on terrorism and that is the spillover of the war into and the expansion of the war into Pakistan so here we have a country of which is destabilized of Afghanistan 25 30 million but for many Pakistanis it is very bizarre and it really confuses the heck out of them to see how the empire can stabilize a country of 30 million by destabilizing, which has taken place, a country of almost 200 million, nuclear armed, and that is the country of Pakistan. And that is what the Af this, this war in Afghanistan has done. The spillover effect into Pakistan and the pressure on the Pakistani uh, military to engage in military operations in areas of the country it had never entered into. Uh, the Northwest tribal areas. Uh, and, and a little bit, you know, is little information about the area is important because it's a very porous border. It was always a very porous border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it was an artificially constructed, uh, you know, border that was created. And I think that uh, it's also important to remember that the, the same, that the Pashtun tribe, more of them are on the uh, from which the, the Taliban come, are on the Pakistani side than on the Afghan side. So these are areas the Pakistani state and military has never entered into, uh, for better or worse, but all of a sudden being pressured to enter into, and that only militarily, not through some serious social, political, and economic engagement for development and so on, but militarily. And since 2004, since the, US, uh, since the Pakistani operations, accompanied by drone strikes and special operations forces from uh, the US, we have seen the rise of the dramatic violence in Pakistan, suicide bombing, so on and so forth. Uh, that rise takes place after the military operations. Now, many, of, many people will say this sounds like a slightly simplistic explanation. Uh, for the rise of this tendency within Pakistan um, and, of course, Afghanistan. And I would say that, yes, it is, because it is, again, because we need to go a little bit even back into history to get the full picture. And I think that this is what happens with regard to Pakistan and Afghanistan. A lot of historical amnesia in terms of our analysis of where the origins of these groups and these tendencies arise. And I think that here we need to go back to the 1980s. And I would argue the rise of uh, these groups, the origins of almost virtually all of them, and they come under so many different names now in Pakistan, um, owes to that period. When radical militant Islam received the greatest boost, uh, perhaps in, in, the, in the modern history of, of, um, of Islamist movements, particularly the more militant violent uh, expressions. And that was, as, ev as everyone here knows, the moment of the Afghan Jihad to oust the evil empire from Afghanistan, the Soviets. And in that process, the entire uh, resistance movement, liberation movement, whatever you want to call it, was termed a jihad. Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former, former US national security advisor, stood on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan and told these, many of them who were students, Taliban, literally means the students, Talib student. These students, many of them orphaned children, 
to go and fight the jihad against these godless communists. This is your struggle. This is your holy war. And so an entire generation and all sorts of groups mobilized in Pakistan, Afghanistan, throughout the Muslim world welcomed many of the Muslim governments who uh, were more than happy to send off some of these characters who they were jailing and so on to go and fight. Everyone got on board. The entire Western world supported it. And then we asked questions, where did uh, all of this come from? Uh, you know, the, the, and I'll conclude this part and, and I'll quickly wrap up, but the entire Osama bin Laden uh, search and, and killing operation is a good uh, in, uh, representation of the historical amnesia that exists in our analysis and understanding of what has transpired. Because in the Western media, as soon as Bin Laden was captured and killed. Questions, oh, what is Bin Laden doing there? Uh, how, why and how were the Pakistani military protecting him? Pakistanis must have known. And yes, of course, those questions were important. But of course, the question that was not asked is when was the first time actually Bin Laden arrived in this part of the region? And that was uh, quite a while ago, and that was in the 1980s, when of course everyone supported that, and he was um, the, our main guy who was mobilizing the Arab Afghans, as they were called, to fight uh, that, that jihad. So this has, this, there's a history to what's going on right now. And Pakistan has been destabilized. And when I say that the, perhaps the most dangerous consequence has been with the situation in Pakistan, I also want to use that word dangerous very cautiously. Because I think that there's also a very uh, oriental, vulgar, vulgar, reductionist portrayal of Pakistan as this country of 200 million extremists, fundamentalists, so on and so forth. And who knows when the nuclear weapons will fall in their hands. I think that uh, is, is complete fantasy and fiction. Uh, I, think, I do think that the policies engaged in only increase the chances of an, a more and more unstable Pakistan. But in terms of the nuclear weapons, um, it must be said that first we all should recognize the double standards and the uh, not so uh, little bit of racism that enters the discussion about who's allowed and who is considered the responsible um, members of the community of nations who are allowed to have nuclear weapons and those who are not. Um, and I think that we, we need to reject those double standards. But Pakistan's nuclear weapons firmly, you know, secure. And I think the only possible threat that exists of instability on that front is division within the military high command, which has never taken place and it hasn't taken place even up until now. But I think the pressures by the Af Afbak war on terrorism only increase the likelihood that serious divisions at some stage may take place. But that's it. In terms of the Taliban or whatever, the small insignificant Al-Qaeda factions, um, that's just a joke. And the final thing I'll come to is this question of, of political Islam and, and, and what's taking place now um, in, in terms of the entire Muslim world. And here I'm very indebted uh, to, to a lot of the comments that, uh, that Phyllis Bennis made earlier in her presentation uh, that one needs to have a deeper, historical, more materialist understanding of where all of this comes from. It hasn't just magically dropped uh, in the Muslim world, these tendencies. Uh, these movements, and it's very fair to say that uh, a variety of expressions of political Islam, Islamist political movements, do dominate uh, large parts of the Muslim world where four, five, six decades ago, movements uh, of the secular, nationalist, left, were hegemonic. That's very important to remind ourselves throughout the Muslim world and the question to ask why. And I think that on the one hand, it is important to emphasize that many of these groups have received in incredible backing by wealthy, uh, you know, whether Gulf countries, by empire, as a counter to those secular nationalist left movements. So that on the one hand, it's important to emphasize. But on the other hand, it's also important to recognize the mistakes and failures of these post-colonial states, degenerating into authoritarian, one state, uh, one party, corrupt um, states as they were. 
many of them who were led by movements who claimed to be national liberation movements, the Ba'athists, Arab socialists, and so on. And the failures of these states to uh, respond to the promises that they made of, of liberation and development, and the rise of an Islamist alternative in this context throughout the Muslim world, although not uniformly in one country. And political Islam, as, as we've emphasized, is not a monolith. It takes a variety of different expressions. Some have uh, women's participation in them. Some are far more democratic than others, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's very important to emphasize. Um, and I think that we here at the Rhodes Forum must also understand that the rise of these groups and the ongoing kind of uh, increase in, in the ranks of these groups is only aided and abetted by the imperial assault in Muslim societies. So now the seventh uh, after um, Obama received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, this is now Syria has become once again the seventh Muslim majority country to be bombed. And I think we need to really have a sense of what that means to Muslims living in Pakistan and trying to have this discussion that no, this global war on terrorism is not a war against Islam. That becomes a very difficult argument to make when it seems that the US war machine continues to just bomb uh, Muslim countries with impunity or the way the Israelis um, continue to operate uh, in the occupied territories and elsewhere. And I think that it is uh, this, this broader context one needs to understand uh, when thinking about the responses emerging from the Muslim world. And the final point I'll say is that earlier on, uh, the point was made about how religion uh, and Islam in particular we were speaking about has been used and manipulated in certain ways, whether by governments or by certain groups. And I agree with that. I mean, the Pakistani state in the 1980s, perfect example of that. But I also think that here at the Rhodes Forum, one of the tasks that we have given ourselves is to decolonize our understandings of a lot of these sacred cows of modernity, liberalism, secularism, certain uh, views of a concept like religion and politics or how the two must be neatly separated according to a, 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 a certain understanding we have. And myself as someone whose politics is deeply inspired by faith, uh, and I make no apologies of that, and others as well from other faith traditions. We uh, find it a bit problematic to just say that religion is, is just used because if they are using it, then perhaps we are also using it for something. And our engagement with our traditions are far more meaningful, holistic, and comprehensive than just a instrumentalist or utilitarian approach. And I think that we have to understand that in the Muslim world, and I dare say throughout the, the world, the religious traditions, as I was discussing with Professor Chandamas, do have a, a role to play. Liberation theology, so on and so forth, throughout the world ha can play a positive role in this context. And the terms of the discourse, we should not allow the empire to set, whether what is defined as a good Muslim or a bad Muslim liberal, um, or any other actors. It is for religious traditions, with Islam, Christianity, and so forth, Buddhism, to determine themselves. And through that, I think we can see the emergence of more liberatory and progressive expressions of Islam. Thank you very much. Thank you.